1913, a now famous astronomer, Edward Bernards, pointed what was then the largest refracting telescope located in the Yerkes Observatory in southern Wisconsin towards the constellation of Orion. What he saw through that telescope was a deep, dark mass of molecular space dust and gases that was blocking the light coming from an ionized red cloud of hydrogen behind it and the silhouette of that dark mass blocking the red ionized light from behind it looked a lot like a horse head. Barnard had made himself previously famous by cataloging comets and also these type of dark nebulae that were very mysterious at that time. And while he was on that image, he managed to take a photograph of it. Tonight we're going to be going after that exact same nebula. And I think you're going to notice a striking difference between what we were able to capture and what Edward Barnard was able to capture using the technology of 1913. We'll talk a little bit about those differences and why amateur astrophotographers can pull off images remarkably better than they could not much more than 100 years ago. Well, the sun is starting to set so we will want to make our way to where we're going to set up. But while we're on our way there, let me tell you a little bit about the Orion constellation and the amazing amount of nebulosity that is there. There's a number of very iconic nebulae, such as the Orion Nebula, adjacent to the Running Man Nebula, the Horsehead Nebula that we're going to go after tonight. Next to it is the Flame Nebula, and there's a lot more Bernard's Loop, and so on and so on. And it's relatively close to Earth. Relatively, meaning these nebulae are about 1,300 light years to 1,500 light years from Earth. Now that's a long ways, but in terms of distance and space, it's relatively close. And because of that, we have been able to study it intensely. The Hubble Telescope, the Spitzer Telescope, and others have been able to observe the creation of new stars and around those new stars, protoplanets. We're learning how solar systems such as ours are created and how planets come into being. Although I'm wearing short sleeves now, it will get cold fast up here, so I have layers of clothing to put on, but right now I'm enjoying it. It's just so nice. Well, the sun is setting, it's going to be a beautiful night up the canyon. The skies are crystal clear, not a cloud to be seen. So we should have a good imaging session. So I'm going to show you an image Edward Bernard took. Bear in mind that his image is a negative. That's what they could do back in those days. So what is white is black and what is black is white. But the comparison is sufficient, I think, for you to see that we're able to do imaging as an amateur that is far superior today than what they could do back in 1913. So really, what are the advantages that we have today over then? There's a number of them, but there's really, in my mind, two big ones. It's not the telescope. This is a reflecting telescope, meaning it has a big mirror in the back. Edward Bernard was using a refracting telescope. They're still used today as well. There's pros and cons to both of them, but they're both very good telescopes. And the differences between those telescopes today and what existed back then, there's some improvement, but that's not the magic. The magic is in this baby right there, the camera. When things moved from film to digital and the chip that's in that camera is super highly sensitive 
and it can absorb the, pro the, the photons coming from 1,500 light years away for long periods of time and capture the depth that film just couldn't do. And in addition to that, we can capture a series of images and then stack them through software that they didn't have in those days. And we can actually see the image building as more and more photons are captured. The image just gets richer and richer. It's called electronically assisted astrophotography. We'll do that tonight. If you've seen my videos in the past, you'll, you've seen that. So that camera, the digital, the chip technology combined with uh, computers and software that can stack these digital images, it's just incredible what we're able to do today. I, my heart goes out to Edward Barnard, at what he pioneered and others like him, what they did with just the, the, the eyeball and minimal imaging uh, capabilities. We owe a lot to them and they cataloged so many objects. They were able to do amazing things with such a limited technology. So we have set up, now all we're gonna do is wait for the sun to continue setting. And then we will polar align. Polaris will be right about up there. And Orion will rise from the east and it will cross the night sky. And we will image it for about three hours. And I think that'll do it for us. And that's another thing that we can capture such brilliant images in short periods of time because of the sensitivity of those chips right there inside those cameras. And the technology just keeps getting better. I'm old fashioned. There's technology that's advanced that I'm not even using yet because I'm like an old dog. You know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I like, I, it takes a lot to get to where I'm at and I wanna change. <laughs> but there's even technology that I haven't adopted yet. So. I need to get on the ball here. Maybe some of you out there can help me out. The telescope that Edward Barnard was looking through in the Yerkes Observatory is still in use to this day, and it is still the world's largest refracting telescope. The aperture, the diameter of the aperture, that hole right there is 40 inches. Mine is about eight. 40 inches inches and the uh, length where mine is about maybe four feet that one is 62 feet long it is a gigantic telescope but what a phenomenal instrument uh, that is it was built in the late 1800s and as mentioned telescope technology really hasn't changed that much it's still in use and it's still an incredible telescope to this day what he didn't have which we talked about before is a camera like that. That makes all the difference. So I'm looking forward to our session tonight. It's still looking better and better. Where did Shadow go? Shadow, come here, boy. Shadow, come. Get his little tracker. Where's he gone off to? Oh, he's right there. <laughs> I look at the tractor and it says, he's very close. <laughs> you funny little guy. He's got his coyote vest on him now. This is coyote country. You gotta keep him safe and they do come out at night and we often hear them howling. Jeez, it's a beautiful night tonight though. Man, it doesn't get any better than this. These sunsets out here can just be stunning. This is a beautiful canyon to come up. What do you think, Shadow? Huh? Do you like it up here? Yes. He wants part of my snack right there. That's what he wants. I've already fed him. He'll keep begging. And eventually I'll give in, which is exactly what you shouldn't do. But how do you say no? 
How do you say no to that little thing? Mm. How do you say no to that? It's like impossible. Well, it's getting close to 11.30. I've got enough time on the image. It's getting time to pack it up. I need to get home. I got to work in the morning. The moon has come out. It's not a full moon, but it's a big, beautiful, bright moon. And we're gonna take one last look at what we've been capturing for the last several hours. There you have it, the thick, dense, dark cloud that is blocking the light from the brilliant ionized hydrogen cloud behind it, thus forming the silhouette of a horse, a horse head, and the flame nebula. But look at that beautiful cloud of hydrogen behind. This looks like, well, it is literally flaming up. It's just a spectacular image. Well, we'll get home and uh, tomorrow I'll process it. We'll show it to you and you can let me know what you think.